Jack David is the co-publisher of ECW Press, a Toronto-based company that publishes fiction and non-fiction, well known as the most significant publisher of books by and about wrestling, ECW releases 60 new titles per year and has won various awards, including the GG for fiction and poetry, not yet non-fiction. Jack, welcome to the Bibliophile again. Thanks, Nigel. Ken White worked for more than 30 years in the magazine and newspaper publishing industry as editor of the Saturday Night Magazine, founding editor of the National Post, editor-in-chief and publisher of McLean's Magazine, president of Rogers Publishing Company. He is the author of award-winning biographies of William Randolph Hearst and Herbert Hoover. His most recent vigorous and provocative book is called The Sack of Detroit, General Motors and the End of the American Enterprise. He's the editor and publisher of Sutherland House Books. He doesn't have any hobbies unless hoarding books can be considered a hobby. And even then, he's trying to get over it. Welcome, Ken, again to the Bibliophile. Happy to be here. Okay, now we're uh, in a very small domestic market in Canada. And so I am going to position this conversation as Canada's lesson for the publishing world, okay? So first of all, can we agree with the first Canadian Governor General, Vincent Massey, I'm just gonna quote him here, that reading is a good thing. Now he addressed the 100th, 125th anniversary dinner of the Ryerson Press in October of 1954. With your indulgence, I'll just, uh, I'll just go through this. It won't take too long. I am not come to offer an apology for books and reading. I shall attempt an apologia, a reasoned defense, unnecessary, even ridiculous in this company, but I believe not inappropriate on this public occasion when we are gathered to honor those who make books their calling. I shall not dwell on what we all know, that books are obviously still the standard means for the recording and communication of facts in ample, precise, and coherent form. In our age, marked by a progressive revelation of new and significant knowledge, there is a constant demand for information which cannot be met by a series of radio talks, however good. On the contrary, as we all know, the usual response to a satisfying series of addresses on the air is the demand that they be printed. As a means of serious communication, there may be supplements too, but there is no substitute for the clear, adequate, permanent, and portable book. Would you care to add to that. Go ahead, Jack. <laughs> Thanks, Nigel. That's a great intro to get the conversation going. <laughs> so, so Massey is talking about the fact that books are important. Exactly. I just want to establish that point with you guys. Yeah, uh, I heartily agree that books are important. Have they been taken over as a means of communication or entertainment by other media? Yes, they have. So okay. why are people watching TV and movies and listening to podcasts and doing whatever else they're doing as opposed to reading books? Right. It's a good question. But during the pandemic, since we're here in 2021, what we found is that people have reverted to books because they can't go out. And if they can't see live entertainment, they can't see live reporting, whatever, they read books. Okay. And book sales, is, according to Publishers Weekly and the last edition, the most recent one, book sales were up 18% overall in the, in the pandemic year. So in some ways, Massey is right. But what's going to happen in eight months or so? That's the question. Okay. Can we agree that reading Canadian books is a good thing? Well, on, on his first point about reading books, I agree uh, they're important. I don't think they're as important as they were in Massey's time. I think there's other ways to access information now. Um, he was talking specifically about the physical object, which is no longer a necessity. Uh, we have e-books, we have 
uh, audio books and so on. And we have the internet, which is an enormous source of information that wasn't available back when he has, but there is still a need for books. There are still some things that books can do that really no other medium can do. So, yeah, I agree with them on that. As far as Canadian books, of course, um, you know, I, I don't think there's any more need for Canadian books than any other national books. I'm always a little bit suspicious of any national literary projects. There's, I do understand the politics and uh, books and authors are a good way to bring you into that. So, yeah, sure, we need Canadian books. Okay, now you in your newsletter, your publishing newsletter, recently wrote that with regard to books, Ottawa and the provinces have been trying to build a Made in Canada publishing sector for 50 years and that they have failed as completely as it is possible to fail. Now, I just spent the last month driving back and forth across the country, visiting bookstores. And there are an incredible number of Canadian books that have been written about Canada. Incredible variety. And uh, I think quite a number that are really good quality. So how's that a failure? Well, you don't have to agree with me, Nigel. (laughs) My point is that... uh... With the amount of enthusiasm that Canadian writers and editors and uh, readers have had for Canadian literature, you know, so they, both the supply and demand of literature and the efforts of publishers over the years, you know, I, thought, I think that they presented a great opportunity and the federal and provincial governments have been trying to shepherd or oversee or direct the course of this literature for 50 years and they've managed to drive it to four percent of the market and to me you know i I was overstating it they could have got two percent of the market so it's not as big a failure as it could have been uh they did get four percent but to me that's a pretty big failure especially given what they set out to do which was have 50 percent of the canadian market over over um a period of time, they can buy Canadian independent publishers. That just hasn't happened. It's a part of the market owned by Canadian independent publishers is, is, is small and shrinking. We've lost most of the big independent publishers that we have. Uh, Jack would know better than I, but, uh, you know, there, there were four or five good size independents, you know, 15, 20 years ago, and they're gone now. We still have some you know, reasonably good sized independents in places like an ANSI and uh, Jack's ECW. Biblioasis, good. Yeah. Sutherland House, I've heard it's pretty good. Very, very, very small uh, relative to those ones that I mentioned before, and certainly relative to, to the multinational branch plants that are operating in Canada and that. Uh, have a huge hold on our market, foreign-owned, foreign-operated publishing houses uh, are the dominant force in Canadian publishing. So to me, it's a failure. It seems to me that, you know, we've got a couple hundred, two or three hundred independent publishers in Canada, and they're producing two two to three thousand books a year. That's compared to, and I'm pulling out the Massey Commission here, in 1948, Canadian books. There were 14 fiction books. There were 35 poetry and drama and six, gen, quote, general. That's, uh, that's an improvement. It's an improvement, but nobody reads it. I mean, you know, as I mentioned in the piece, you look for... A, you know, a work of adult fiction and nonfiction in the top 300 best-selling books in Canada, and there's one, Tanya Talaga's 
book. Uh, and, and that that's it in the top 300 bestsellers in Canada. Yeah. Yes, there are, you know, two, 3,000 books produced every year by independent publishing houses. But altogether, they amount to 4% of the Canadian market. That's pathetic. Most of those books uh, are doing nothing but generating landfill. So, you know, there's some really good books in there uh, and really worthy books. And it's nothing against the attempts of the authors or the attempts of the publisher. But the fact is, they are not meeting the market. And uh, uh, the project of producing a homegrown, independently owned, Canadian owned uh, publishing sector is nowhere near anything that could be called a measure of success. Let me jump in because I would slightly disagree with my esteemed colleague from the Sutherland House. If you take a look at individual provinces, individual cities, regions, you'll see that the expansion of the number of books has reached into St. John's and Halifax and BC, especially, I can name you publishers in Alberta, Manitoba, in all kinds of genres, from fiction to poetry to kids' books to educational books to reference books. They may not be bought in great numbers, but if you're a resident of British Columbia, you now have the ability, if you want, to find a book about hikes into the Kootenays or a big fire that's taking place in Kamloops. You find books that are about individual BC pioneers. You find books that deal with the BC government, the provincial government, books that deal with the mayor of Vancouver. So on, on an example of what's happening, if there was not support, uh, my position is that most of those books would not be published and the public would be badly treated by not having those books. The fact that they don't sell 50,000 copies or 5,000 copies or 1,000 copies, I don't think matters if the book is worthy and it's going to be around for a while. But without government funding, we wouldn't have those books. But without government funding, we wouldn't have roads. We wouldn't have hospitals. We wouldn't have a lot of stuff. The point is that the government funding is there to support Indigenous, what I would call Indigenous Canadian publishing by Canadian publishers, Canadian authors. Otherwise, we can't deal with the Daniel Steeles of the world. Okay, I'm going to come in with one more uh, sleep-inducing quote about this, and it's from one of the great Canadian publisher editors, Lorne Pierce, who ran the uh, Ryerson Press for many years. Here's what he said. One does not apologize for being oneself and standing in one's own shoes. What has value for us, what reveals special insights, records unique ways of life, will have value and interest for other people and enlarge their horizons. Whatever is vital will live, at least for a time. What is not usable dies and is plowed under. One may have many international interests, one may even be regarded as cosmopolitan, but fundamentally, that is down deep at the foundation of things. One is always a native son, a birthright child of time and place, and that is the secret and the strength of our infinite variety and endless interest as a Canadian people. Can you comment on that, Ken? I kind of tuned out halfway through. <laughs> I, I think he's saying that the, there's a case for local literature. Is that what he's saying? Local national literature? Well, I think what he's suggesting, for example, is that Canadians not just try and come up with Shit's Creek, but come up with something that's actually Canadian, as opposed to trying to appeal to an international audience. Yeah, I... I, I by the way, I thought Shit's Creek was a pretty good show. Um, uh, I didn't say it was. Uh, I didn't say it was shitty. And I have. I, I have no problem with people producing books for local audiences. I have no problem with people producing books that don't sell. I agree with everything Jack said about local literature and 
some of the you know good quality stuff that's available uh, to people in different regions of the country. My point is that the provincial and the federal programs were designed to produce a made in Canada, Canadian owned publishing industry. And uh, there were all kinds of policies that were supposedly going to keep the multinationals from dominating our market, keep ownership of Canadian publishing houses in Canada, ensure that uh, the dominant expressions of literature available in Canada were Canadian. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, that project and that project is the project that's failed. It doesn't mean that individual writers and individual publishers, as I said at the outset, aren't doing worthwhile things. I'm talking about the aims of the policies that the government's put in place and how we assess their progress over the last half century. And uh, notwithstanding everything that Jack said, I don't see how anyone can believe that those uh, uh, objectives have been met as far as you know, producing a literature for Canada as opposed to one for the world. I don't really have strong feelings on that. I've spent a lot of my career writing for a Canadian audience. I've spent a lot of my career writing for a non-Canadian audience. Uh, I, you know, I, I know a lot of people who do both. I read a lot of both. Uh, I think they're all... Uh, worthwhile. But I do believe that the market is increasingly global. Canadians have shown by their purchasing habits, their reading habits, that they consider themselves citizens of the world and, and are just as likely to read about something happening in India as they are something happening in Canada. We're very cosmopolitan people. Why not embrace that over, you know, being uh, parochial uh, narrow, nationalistic, provincial. I, I think you can make the argument both ways. Do you want to respond to that, Jack? Or It is true that the Canadian industry has not made headway into the marketplace as, as the government thought it might, and that the percentage of the overall sales is declining. It's also true that Many Canadian publishers, especially on the kids' side, have been very successful at selling books into the world market. An example would be the Robert Munch book that's always on the New York Times bestseller list. Other books that have achieved success in translation in other countries. And the 4% number that Ken uses doesn't include what the export revenues are for various companies because it's only Canadian sales that are accounted for in the stats from Heritage. In our case, for example, we sell about 45% of our books into the U.S. And if you include that, then you see that we have a market share, but it's a market share that is including other things. And it doesn't show up in our ebook sales and our audiobook sales, it doesn't show up in our production sales, it doesn't show up in a lot of places. So I would put us, I would put ECW forward as a company that has, in fact, established more of an international scope and add on to that kids publishers like Barca and like Groundwood and like Anik, who have made a real mark and whose sales are significantly higher outside of Canada than inside Canada. So has the policy been a failure? If it's based on market share and an increasing market share, then yes, but we have to define market share. And the second thing is, has it been a failure in terms of putting seeds in the ground in places where there were no publishers, where authors had no local opportunities before? Then it's been a huge success. Um, I, I think that uh, he's right. One of the unintended consequences of uh, the program has been that a lot of publishers, including ECW, Southern House, are increasingly looking to global markets, looking beyond the Canadian markets in order to book sales that will, you know, float the enterprise 
um, because it's really hard to do it on a Canadian only basis that you know it is I think a good thing it's again uh, an unintended consequence as it wasn't part of the original program but it's slowly being recognized uh, I think by the grant granting agencies is something important because they are starting to encourage exports more now uh, and uh, I think uh, as I, I said in in the same, newsletter, I, I think that's uh, something that Canada should do more of is push Canadian literature out into the world. I'd like to see a lot of the great authors that we have be able to publish someday first in Canada uh, and stay in Canada uh, for, for their careers. You know, we've sent a lot of Canadians to the U.S., Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the best Canadian writers publish first in the U.S. Uh, or even the U.K. rather than in Canada. Uh, I think if uh, we had stronger firms with a bigger international market share, uh, we'd be able to keep, you know, not, not all of them, not the Atwoods or the Gladwells, but we'd be able to keep more of uh, our strongest writers within the country. But that's an old story, and it goes back to the time when people like Richter found no publishing home in Canada, mm -hmm. went to England. And then when he finally came back in the mid-late 60s, the environment had opened up a bit, so he could find a local home. And a bunch of other writers who also came home, a lot who left and never came back, and a lot who left and came back eventually. Yeah. So for me, that's an old story. But uh, you know, all of those people, the Richlers, the Mavis Gallants, and so on, still publish primarily outside of the country. They yeah. did find a Canadian publisher, but it was uh, their primary publisher was in, in New York. It seems to me, uh, Ken, that your point about the government failure uh, is as much as anything an in foreign investment issue. They haven't and didn't enforce their foreign ownership regulations. And in fact, Penguin Random House, as outlined in uh, Elaine Dewar's book, The Handover, basically duped the Canadian government into th believing or treating them as a domestic company and as a result got millions of possibly tens of millions of dollars out of the Canadian government, which seems to me to be a kind of a story of the Canadian economy, of American companies coming in, pretending to be Canadian, and taking a ton of profits out of our country. Um, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to that story, but there have been a number of attempts through the years to limit ownership of publishing in Canada to Canadian firms. It was supposed to be from the mid eighties onwards that if, you know, a foreign branch plant operating in Canada, like Penguin or like Simon and Schuster, if Random House comes along and buys Penguin or buys Simon and Schuster, the Canadian operations of those firms are supposed to be offered to Canadian ownership first, but that uh, has has not happened, and I don't believe in the future will happen. That's not the way foreign investment is trending on a global basis, even post Trump. So, uh, I, I I think we've completely failed. You know, uh, we we not only have most of the Canadian market dominated by foreign publishers, but we've got most of the uh, Canadian market dominated by what will soon be two firms, yeah. Penguin Random House, Simon & Schuster on the one hand, and HarperCollins on the the other. So we've, <laughs> we, we were supposed to have a competitive Canadian-owned industry, and instead we have a monopolistic internationally-owned <laughs> industry, which uh, is another... And in my view, proof of the failure of uh, the system over the last 50 years. Isn't that the story of the Canadian economy, though? It's basically a, a, a foreign companies coming in willing to make an investment 
investing, taking a risk, and then basically getting all the profits. We get some jobs out of it. We get some, maybe some infrastructure. Uh, we get a decent standard of living. But the bulk of the profits, just like in the publishing sector here now, go out of the country. It's a story of part of the Canadian economy, and, and uh, you can look at different sectors and see a lot of U.S. ownership, especially in the retail sector, for for instance, used to be dominated by the Bay and Eatons, and now it's all international chain stores and uh, international uh, department stores. So, yeah, that, that, that's gone the same way as publishing. But on the other hand, if you look at our broadcast sector... Yeah, but that's because that's been uh, legislated. That was legislated. Yes. yes. Well, so 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 was uh, you know the original third investment review policies, that, and uh, you know the the um, government also uh, committed to what's known as the Bay Camo policy from the mid '80s, which is the one that said if a Simon and Schuster or Random House is changing hands, the Canadian operations need to be sold, and and uh, that hasn't been followed. Either it was a policy, it wasn't legislation, but it's the same principle. It was uh, how the system was supposed to work, and it hasn't worked that way. So, you know, we've managed to protect Canadian ownership in some, or not even protect, maintain, yeah. and in some cases protect Canadian ownership with some sectors. And we've been quite diligent uh, uh, about it, you know, in banking and insurance and broadcast and so on. But we've really failed in publishing. My hope is that, you know, Jack is soon big enough to, to <laughs> buy up uh, Penguin Random House and, and this, all these problems go away. But we're still, I think, a few years from that. I think the other side of that is that since the Bay Como policy has never been implemented, and there's a million examples of that, that at this point, if PRH comes along and says, I'd like to buy ECW. No one would stand in the way. And they would pay a substantial amount more than any Canadian company would. And the way companies have changed hands recently in the States, they're getting between one and two and 2.5 times revenue. So if someone, if someone came along and said, I'd like to buy ECW, whatever the granting situation is, we're going to pay you two times revenue. Then that would be very tempting. Do you think, Jack, that any, and I don't mean ECW in particular, uh, we, you're, you're right. We've seen a lot, a lot of consolidation. You know, it seems like every two weeks there's another firm getting snapped up by one of the big guys around the world. I don't know that that's going to happen in Canada. I would like to see it happen. I would like to be see uh, an ECW or a Nancy, you know, if, if the owners decided that they were uh, at the end of their careers or at a place in their lives where they wanted an exit strategy. I'd love to see them be able to go out to Penguin Random House or Hachette and say, I'm available and get 1.25 or 1.5 revenues. The big difference in Canada, though, is that those grants aren't available to multinational firms. And none of our major publishers, I think, our uh, independent publishers are close to profitable without grants. So I don't think the same sort of valuation applies to Canadian firms. And to me, that's another way that the whole system has failed. That's true, Ken, except that the books that are not profitable would be dropped immediately by the acquiring company. And those are the books that attract a lot of the grant support. So if you if you called our list of 60 books and you said, we're only going to keep the wrestling books and the music books and the pop culture books, you would see a pretty profitable company. When I'm not saying it, there isn't something to buy, Jack. I just don't think it's 1.5 revenue or 1.25 revenue or anything. It's a but it would be, kind of deal. It, would be, it wouldn't be times entire revenue. It would be times whatever, uh, 0.8 or something. Yes. Yeah. But it would still be a, a shitload of money compared to whatever we would get elsewhere from anybody else. Nobody in Canada is about to buy us and consolidate us. Yes. 
Agreed. If the, your exit strategies then are within Canada, nothing, and outside of Canada at a discount for all of the books that you publish on behalf of Canadian literature. Yeah, and the other exit strategy is to continue doing what you're doing and gradually reduce the number of books that you're publishing and let the backlist provide you with that retirement income. And still, still take the grants as much as you can. Yeah. Agreed. I think what we're talking about here, too, is kind of a microcosm of the Canadian experience over the decades. It's, what's the Canadian dream? It's to grow a company to a point where you can sell it to the highest bidder, and that highest bidder happens typically to be American or a foreign company, whereas in the publishing sector... Uh, because it's, I guess, because it's just not attractive to foreigners, that hasn't happened. It's just because they're, the companies aren't really worth buying. Is that what you're saying? No, um, I, I think there's definitely some companies worth buying, but the economics are really, you know, twisted. We're, we're really the only country that does this uh, amount of granting and, and yeah. this amount of force feeding of uh, our, our our publishing companies, and I'm not just saying it's a bad thing. So, you know, it, uh, I, I do agree. Some goods come out of it. I, 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 my point again is that overall the system has failed its objectives. But you know, going going back to um, the sale of a company, the economics are all twisted because of the grants. You basically have otherwise, you know, you take the grants away and you have an insolvent company, uh, and it's hard to sell to anybody on on those terms. And the grants aren't transferable. Yeah. So if you know, even an independent rather than uh, say Gray uh, Gray Wolf, uh, a great uh, independent publisher out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, not yeah. uh, for for a profit publisher, but do really good work. Looks at Jack's lists and think, Christ, there's a really good way for us to get into the Canadian market. Let's buy ECW. Uh, they could do it, but then they wouldn't be eligible for yeah. the, the million or so in grants that Jack gets annually from uh, provincial and federal governments, and as a result. You know, they'd be buying something that, for their purposes, would be in the red. Seriously, so it, it's uh, again one of the real problems of the system as, as we set it up is that it's produced a lot of publishing companies. They're all mostly small. N no, nobody has much scale. Nobody has much capital, and those who do want to grow, uh, those that do want to look at acquiring competitors or joining forces with competitors um, have a really hard time doing so because of the nature of the granting business. Yeah. Without derailing your conversation direction here, I think the question becomes, so what's next? So what do we do? Are we looking for an increase in market share by Canadian-owned companies? Are we looking for more access to selling the company, better better method of selling the company? Are we looking to enforcement of the big home policy? Are we looking to some kind of consolidation within the industry? Is that going to help? That's a, I, I agree. I think that's exactly the question, and I want to know what Jack's answer is. <laughs> well, and we've thought about consolidation within within the industry, but if, if ECW is consolidating, say, with ANSI in whatever way, there's no improvement. Mm. We have the same distribution system. We have the same sales force. We have the same discounts with Indigo chapters. We have the same people that we deal with on foreign sales. So it's just increasing revenue. It's not increasing profitability. It's not increasing efficiency. So what else happens? Well, it would be us buying an educational company, although education has gone down to shitter, so it's not going to be that. It would be us looking at buying a Quebec-based French language publisher. But we don't know anything about that stuff. We wouldn't put our nose in there for sure. So the only opportunity for us is to find someone who was a complement to our list. And that would be 
a genre publisher, let's say there were a great science fiction publisher in Canada, then that would be that would be entertaining to us. Or a kids publisher, or some other aspect like that. But in general, no, there's no advantage to consolidation and not on the grant side, and even even, even harming you on a grant side. Does that screw up the next series of articles you're going to write, Ken? No, I agree with Jeff. I um, <laughs> I think there is a, a little more advantage in consolidation if it's smartly done than than he suggests, and and you know he's just consolidated a children's publisher, so I know he agrees with me at least that far. Um, and like I said, if you know, like he said, if there were genre publishers available, maybe Harlequin comes up for sale again. Jack could uh, buy that, and that would be a nice bolt on. Uh, so you know, I think there are ways to to uh, expand if you do it carefully, and uh, you know why you're doing it, and it's additive rather than just giving you uh, you know more exposure to what you're already doing i think that that's kind of limited in a limited route in the canadian marketplace so generally i agree with jack i think that um, if you want to get a publisher with scale based in canada the way to do it is to encourage canadian publishers to uh, be more active and effective internationally um mm. I, I think you know right now if um you know jack does wrestling books if he ha- finds that one of the best wrestling author in, in in the world happens to live in say pittsburgh and wants to do a book with ecw because ecw is the best place to publish these kinds of book it's hard for jack to do it because jack can't get access to all the granting uh, support that he would if the same author happened to live yeah. in Nova, Nova Scotia. So that, you know, if you're looking at yeah. an industrial strategy for publishing and helping these uh, small houses become bigger uh, and stronger and better capitalized and more employ more people and produce more expertise in Canada and really grow the sector... I think figuring out a way to really support our industries uh, in in entering uh, our publishing industry and entering the global market makes a lot of sense. Except that virtually all our wrestling authors are American. We have the only Canadians we have are the people who dealt with Andre the Giant because they were Quebec based. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is American and we treat those books as if we were based in Tonawanda, as opposed to Toronto. We have to make money on those books purely on sales basis. There's no grant support at all. Yeah, but That's what Ken said, though. If you grant support, you'd be able to make a lot more money on those books, and you'd have more capital, which is what you complain about not having enough of. Yep. Well, it's, it's like the development of, of the Canadian CDC. It's like if, there's a, if the government can help you compete to provide advances, not just to Canadian authors, but to authors around the world, would that be helpful? I think so, yeah. Now, what, Jack, Jack also has stories, though, about what happened to Sheila Cox when she tried that. <laughs> okay, just, uh, uh, just to play devil's advocate here, I'm a pretty happy consumer as far as being able to read about my own country. There's some great uh, university press publishers in, in Canada. I, I'm thinking of the U of T and uh, McGill Queens primarily. A couple of the best books I've read in the last uh, year have been published by these houses. So I'm pretty well served. And Canadian authors who are popular are also well served by the giants, uh, I, I think. Well, it's fine, Nigel. If you're happy, then let's not worry about the fact that you know Canadian publishers only have four percent of the market. <laughs> That's the important thing that you're you're, you're happy. <laughs> well, that that was me playing devil devil's advocate there. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I am not, I'm never happy with all of these profits that are getting sucked out of our country. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My father-in-law was friends with a guy years and years ago who had the first Sony distribution business in Canada. And they had transistor radios and he was selling them by the carload. And then one day somebody woke up in Japan and said, we're doing a lot of business in Canada and this guy is slicing off all the profits. So we're just going to take over and set up our own operation. Right. That That's partly the, the Canadian story as well. And once you establish the beachhead, the, the dominant company, the ownership company comes in, takes over. Canadian publishers used to be agents, didn't they? For the other pub, for the world publishers around the world. Yeah. So what's uh, what is the solution again to basically stopping all this profit going out of our country? I missed that part of the conversation, the solution part. <laughs> That's why you guys were invited. I talk about this all the time. Um, uh, I keep proposing things and Jack keeps shooting them down. And, and given that he's more experienced than I am, I, I've been forced to conclude that there uh, is no obvious uh, solution. But again, I uh, lean towards uh, embracing. But first of all, if, if there are some publishers that just want to remain small and publish what they consider to be art and not to be bothered by market considerations and to receive government funding, that's fine. Let them do so. Right. Uh, but I think the one thing that really hasn't been attempted in uh, Canadian publishing since all of these programs started is a dedicated attempt to put Canadian publishing on a commercial footing. Right. And that means um, getting their balance sheets in, in, in shape that they are sellable enterprises. Uh, and, and, and so consolidation uh, can can have uh, a better chance uh, allowing them to uh, and encouraging them to compete in a global content market because we're not going back to national markets uh, in in content things especially in the age of Amazon are increasingly global and that's only going to be more the case than in, in, in the future it doesn't mean we can't still do local books we, we still will do local books but the big opportunities and what our most ambitious authors and publishers will be looking towards will be those international ones. That to me is uh, the direction to go. Uh, I'm not sure that anyone in Canadian publishing aside from me thinks so. There were discussions before the collapse of general distribution that certain companies would get together and the the matchup was going to be Key Porter plus Douglas and McIntyre and maybe Stoddard into one group that would then have perhaps 25 or $30 million in sales. The majority of that, most of that being in Canada. And one of the problems in, in making that work was that the publishers of Key Porter and Douglas and McIntyre couldn't decide who was going to be the chief operator. Yeah, yes. <laughs> there we go. Ego. Because you've been running, you started your company and you're running your company. Yeah. And now you've got to share it with somebody else. And publishers in general don't tend to operate that way. Yeah. I, I disagree with that, Jack. I, I think it's true. I, I'm, not, I'm not denying the specifics of the uh, example that you chose. Uh, but, that, you know, that was at a time when everybody was pretty much in, in mid career and they don't stay there forever. And the reason Penguin Random House has got to be Penguin Random House with its, what, 300 and some imprints is because it's snapped up all of these available uh, publishers. So, you know, timing is important. Uh, you know, every, not everything's for sale at, at once, but things, things do come up. And uh, as you said earlier, I think the uh, smart route to consolidation isn't necessarily putting together four firms that all essentially do the same thing but putting together the children's publisher and the book publisher and the genre publisher and the general publisher into a well-rounded uh organization you know and and then you start to get to a place where uh you can dream about uh consistent repeatable 
sales and market share and then uh, more acquisition or more, more access to capital, uh, more ability to expand, especially if you can look at it uh, on, on a global basis. You know, ECW's next move could be buying Grey Wolf rather than the other way around. Okay, so just to wind up here, Canadian Indies should continue to be farm teams for Penguin Random House or this new Canadian conglomerate that the government is going to help with some kind of funding to market themselves internationally. Is that, that the solution? Well, that's not what I said, no. Oh, I, I thought that's what you said. <laughs> Our farm team suggests that they're gonna, you're going to go from junior A to, to the NHL. No, 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 it doesn't. We're stay, they're staying as farm teams. They pick the good players, and then the big boys see who's good and run with them. It's not that common that, that it happens. Everybody thinks that's the way it works. Okay. But the big guys are always on the lookout for that new author as much as the independents are. And the only and the only value that somebody has in Saskatchewan is that they're closer to the ground, right? And they can somebody is coming along. But think of how many Saskatchewan writers have, have been plucked out of Saskatchewan <laughs> by PRH, Harpercollins, or Sanchez. Not many, right? It's a publisher that was so, plucked out of Saskatchewan, though that I know. I think I have to say this. I agree with Ken on this point <laughs> that the the people who are doing literary especially and political books and social whatever kind of books and have small markets and they're doing it because they have a passion for it and they believe in what they're publishing fine god go with you and let the government support you mm -hmm. yeah I, I that's what i'm saying is we keep that going but if you want to create jobs and a, some bigger canadian publishing firms isn't that what you're saying ken that there should be some amalgamation and then we have a couple of big Canadian publishing firms? I, I think there's a number of measures that need to be taken to put the larger, more ambitious, uh, commercially ambitious uh, Canadian publishers on a stronger footing. And that is, you know, it comes in the nature of the grants. They, they would receive something that's uh, more transactional and less juried is the juried grants, especially at the Canada Council, tend to go to uncommercial books, uh, and uh, that slows down a, a lot of large publishers. And uh, I, I, I think as well, um, you know, uh, allowing them and encouraging them to embrace an international market and international writers uh, and so that they're not so limited yeah. to uh, Canada and the Canadian market would be helpful as well. So, uh, you know, I think there's a number of things we can do on that front uh, to uh, help those uh, publishers who want to be commercially significant become commercially significant. Yeah. Uh, even, you know, getting someday as big as Jack's place. <laughs> but how many are there, Ben? I don't know really uh, how many there are. I can think of about a half a dozen off the top of my head. I think if the rules were set up different, you'd get more. Maybe. Okay, so we need a separate commercial strategy and a cultural strategy. Separate them and better define them. Is that it? Yeah, we're kind of sucking and blowing at the same time with our policy right now. We're saying, you know, be small literary publishers and care only about uh, the literary component and the cultural component at the same time we're saying you know here's things to do to be more commercial uh, so uh, I, I think some division between those mandates uh, from the granting point of view would help I also think there's inherent in, in the granting system a, a bias against commercial publishers. Uh, mm -hmm. They think that the only good literary work comes out of these small, uh, devoted literary publishers. Uh, but I think Penguin Random House and others have shown you know, the, the two best 
uh, literary houses in the world at the moment are probably Knopf and uh, FSG, and they're both part of big conglomerates. So you can do good literary work from within a commercially ambitious firm, and and uh, they're they're not mutually exclusive things. So yeah, I think we need to create some division in the way we approach these things, so that people who want to do small literary presses can do them, people who want to have more commercially significant presses uh, employ more people and, and have a bigger footprint in the market uh, can be encouraged differently. Okay, very final question for, for this round anyway. I interviewed uh, Marion Sinclair from Scotland and she was pretty well drooling over how fecund <laughs> our government funding was yeah she thought it was wonderful so i guess our our publishing sector should be grateful for one thing so as i say she sees it as a bit of a model is there anything from your experience that you can offer all of our publishing executives from around the world who are listening to us I think the grants are good. I think the issue becomes ultimately who is selecting which titles from which authors and that the whole basis of our operation is publishing good books that are sellable. And if you don't have somebody or some people who can make that kind of selection, then you're going to go out of business pretty quickly no matter what you do, grants or no grants. So what we have to do is we have to train people to be good acquisition editors. That's a key that's a key factor. And then you acquire and then people look at you and say, I think I would like you to acquire for my company. The rest will follow. Hmm. I agree with Jack on that. I agree with Jack on everything and, and uh you know I, I wanna state as well that Jack uh is is the the example uh from which all of my ideas stem. I mean he is the one who has tried to step out of the Canadian market and go deeper into the U.S. and he does get 40% of his sales down there. Yeah. And he is commercially ambitious and, and sells uh, and publishes books that are meant to find an audience and do find audiences. And he uh, has uh, shown a, a willingness to, to grow and uh, consolidate with his acquisition of a major uh, children's publisher. So, you know, I, I think uh, all of my ideas are, are kind of redundant to Jack's career. And, and uh, I, I, I just need to give him credit for, for all of that. Uh, as far as, the, you know, international people drooling over the subsidies in Canada, um, <laughs> I think I think uh, it looks good on the surface to you know have uh, the, these uh, monies coming in, but you know just being exempted in the UK from sales tax, value added tax, is worth a ton to uh, that market. And I think if you would put something like that, if you added up the total amount of money on grants and put it against what the industry would save not having to pay uh, HST on books in Canada. It might be a wash. Mm. Uh, I think you know th those are the kinds of things that we should really, uh, if as we think about the future of the industry, you know, give, give some serious consideration to what's going on in other countries. We are an outlier. Do we really want to stay? Uh, an outlier is there not better ways we can do things. As I said, 50 years and we're down to 4% of the market. So maybe we ought to consider some other options. Ken talked about Grey Wolf and I was at a seminar years ago where there were some American publishers, including Grey Wolf and uh, Copper Canyon, some other American small literary presses. And they asked us what kind of granting programs we had and we told them and they were just, they were agog. And we said, well, what do you do? And they said, well, we're nonprofits. And when we took a look at their numbers, they got more money from, from foundations than we did from the government. Yeah, Grey, Grey Wolf and Coffee House and those Minnesota ones get all kinds of breaks and supports. Mm -hmm. if, if you compare 
how a company, how a literary press or a small press is able to manage, you have to actually go and take a look at the financial statements and see where their income is coming from. So I agree with Ken as usual. So, so both of you guys really agree with each other, and I, and and I disagree with you, though, Mike. And, well, I was going to say and revere each other too, obviously. Uh, but I, what I want to do is to say first of all that Jack has put in a heroic amount of time developing and helping small literary presses in Canada. He's also done a hell of a lot of work in that field. So he's not just a wrestling guy. Uh, and also, so thank you for that, uh, Jack. And Ken, thank you for your considered, intelligent, humorous newsletter. I really enjoy reading it. And thank you for making that contribution. And thank you both for joining me. Well, we don't want you to get a swelled head, Nigel, but Jack and I were talking the other day and we both agreed that what you're doing is uh, an incredible uh, service to Canadian letters and that of uh, uh, everything that's going on here, at the end of the day, you're going to have an archive that's probably worth more than anything we do in, in all of these uh, uh, recordings that you're doing with people around the world in the publishing industry. So thanks very much for having us on. It's been a pleasure. Jack David is the, what are you, Jack? King of publishing. And Ken, what are you? I'm just, you know. You're the Dauphin? Jack's footstep, central punches. Very good. Thanks both again. Great pleasure.